the safety of food and medicine. Title, Foods Derived from New Plant Varieties. Date, May 29, 1992. Principle 1. Foods derived from genetic modification are regulated within the existing framework that applied to foods developed by traditional plant breeding. Obviously, the FDA decided not to create a special category for GMOs. For further information, contact James Mariansky, who headed the biotechnology department at the time. Basically, the government had taken a decision that it would not create new laws, that it felt there were already sufficient laws in place that had enough authority for the agencies to deal with new technologies. That means the White House asked the agency to write a policy where GMO should not be submitted to a specific regulatory regime? But it's not based on scientific data. It's a political decision? Yes, it was a political decision. It was a very broad decision that didn't apply to just foods. It applied to all products of biotechnology. Unbelievable. James Mariansky admits that GMO regulation was based on politics rather than science. How exactly did they justify their decision? Principle 2. The components of food as a result of genetic modification of a plant will be the same as or substantially similar to substances commonly found in food. In other words, the FDA considers that a genetically modified plant is equivalent to its conventional counterpart. What they call the principle of substantial equivalence has been adopted around the world and it's at the heart of the debate between biotech supporters and GMO foes. How could the FDA decide that a GMO crop is the same as a conventional plant? What we do know is that the genes that are being introduced currently, to date, using biotechnology, produce proteins that are very similar to proteins that we've consumed for many centuries. That's the FDA's official position on the matter, which was toppled by Jeffrey Smith, author of several books on GMOs. Michael Hansen, scientific expert for the Consumers Union of the United States. And writer Jeremy Rifkin, who was the first to denounce the principle of substantial equivalence. The reason why GM crops are here is based on a deception that occurred in the FDA. They said that these foods are not different. They used the word substantially equivalent. They used the word not meaningfully or uniformly different. And what that turned into was a, a terminology called generally recognized as safe, or grass. Typically, if something is to be considered generally recognized as safe, it needs lots of peer-reviewed published studies and an overwhelming consensus among the scientific community. With GM crops, they had neither. What FDA was saying was if you introduce a gene into a plant, that gene is DNA, and we've consumed G DNA. We have a long history of consuming DNA, and we, we can establish that that is grass. We were trying to say that these things should be considered food additives. When you want to put a new coloring agent in a food, the tiniest bit of coloring agent or uh, a preservative or some other tiny chemical, that's considered a food additive, and you have to go through all these procedures to show it's... Uh, that it meets the criterion of reasonable certainty of no harm, but when you genetically engineer a food which can cause untold differences in that plant, they don't require anything. Here in Washington, if you, if you were to have an evening and go out and get a drink uh, at one of the local haunts where all the lobbyists hang out, uh, everybody would laugh about this. They all know this was a joke, this substantial equivalency. This was simply a way to paper over uh, the need for these companies, especially Monsanto, to move their products into the environment quickly with the least amount of government interference. And I should say uh, they were uh, very, very good at getting their uh, interest uh, expressed. I remember meetings that we had where the Monsanto scientists uh, met with the FDA scientists and 
they went through the kinds of modifications that they were making and how those were being done. And basically what they were also saying to FDA is, how will these products be regulated? I have never seen a situation where one company could have so much overwhelming influence at the highest levels of regulatory decision making as the example of Monsanto with its GM food policy in the government. Exceptional news footage actually shows George Bush Sr. visiting Monsanto's research facility nine years before Roundup Ready soybeans were first sold. What I'd like to uh, do today is show you some of the steps we go through when we're moving uh, genes from uh, one organism into another. And you'll actually be doing the, the very little manipulations we do in the laboratory where we take DNA, cut it apart, mix different pieces together, and then rejoin them, them and splice them back together. This tube contains DNA that was made from a bacterium. The DNA see, would look the, the same whether it was from a uh, plant or what an animal. What are we animal. saying here? Oh, I see. And this will lead you to do what? To have a stronger plant or a plant that that's, uh, resists the uh, in, uh, in this case, it resists the herbicide. I see. We have a fabulous herbicide. This is a chemical that will... When George Bush Sr. toured the company's headquarters, he was Ronald Reagan's vice president. And deregulation was this Republican administration's watchword. The intention was to boost industry by eliminating what White House hardliners called bureaucratic hurdles, like health and environmental safety testing, which were Monsanto's key problems. We have before USDA right now a, a request to test this uh, for the first time in a, on a farm in, uh, in Illinois this year. And uh, again, yeah. hallucinating about it, hallucinating. Yes, and, 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 and then uh, the expense goes on and nothing happens. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say, quite frankly, we have no complaint about the way USDA is handling it. Uh, they're going through an orderly process. They're making sure Very that they deal with these new things, they do them properly. and. Uh, no, if we're waiting until September, we don't have our authorization. We may <laughs> say something different. <laughs> Call me. We're in a direct. <laughs> In 1988, when George Bush Sr. was elected president of the United States, Dan Quayle became the new vice president. Four years later, he announced the American policy concerning GMOs, drafted just as Monsanto had wanted. We are taking this step as part of the President's Regulatory Relief Initiative, now in its second phase. The United States is already the world leader in biotechnology, and we want to keep it that way. In 1991 alone, it was a $4 billion industry. It should reach at least $50 billion by the year 2000, as long as we resist the spread of unnecessary regulation. Do you think it, it was really a conspiracy? A conspiracy is a strong word. From a corporate standpoint, it was a brilliantly executed takeover. Early on, uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Taylor became the deputy uh, administrator of the Food and Drug Administration right at the time that they were about to set out their policy. Who is Michael Taylor? On the internet, only a single image remains of the man who once wielded his power so discreetly. Today, he has a foundation called Resources for the Future. Hello, Mary Monique speaking. Hello, it's Mike Taylor. My questions are about your, your role. I mean, when you uh, were working at the FDA, yeah. Um, before hi being hired by the FDA, you worked as an attorney for Monsanto during seven years, didn't you? Well, I was a partner in a law firm of which Monsanto was a client. And uh -huh. I worked on some Monsanto matters, yes. Uh -huh. And apparently, if I understood well what I read, and the FDA created a new position for you, Deputy Commissioner for Policy? Well... Because it's a special need at that time uh, at the FDA because of the new GMOs? Uh... It, had, it had nothing to do with GMOs. Ah. Nothing at all to do with GMOs. I wasn't the author of these policies. But that's, that, that's very, that's just false. 
He moved over to the FDA in July of 1991. Up until that time, he was at a law firm called King & Spaulding. His personal clients included not only Monsanto, but the International Food Biotechnology Council. And he had drafted for them a proposal for how they would like to see genetically engineered foods regulated. And if you look at the proposal that was written for IFBC that was Michael Taylor's with the final one that was published, it looks very, very similar. So he, if he didn't write it, it looks like somebody took what he wrote and changed it slightly for the policy. Mr. Taylor was the um, uh, deputy commissioner at the time. And he provided the leadership um, for the project and served as the, the chief, uh, the sort of the lead uh, policy person in terms of uh, making sure that the project got done.